Well, here we are. Okay. Got it. Good. Okay. Good morning. Wait, it's only, well, it's 10 o'clock. It's not like it's early in the morning. Um, here. Obviously, that's just because I'm so egotistical. These are the little drawings I sent out to my VIP Patreon patrons every month. This is what I'm sending out. A couple of them sending out to this week. So, just so you know. And let me see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Woo. Well, this is my fourth day of doing this. I'm doing it all through the month of May. And then um, in June, I go back to teaching college all online. Uh, so at this time on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'll be uh, teaching my college class. Uh, but uh, and, but I'm still going to do something on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So maybe I'll do it before the um, before the uh, class. It only starts at 11:40, so I could do something between like nine and nine and eleven, something like that. Nine eleven thirty. Give me a chance to go run the bathroom before class starts, and then. Uh, but I, I like to keep this going because it's it's not too taxing, and Lordy knows I haven't got anything else to do. Uh, I'm hunkered down at home. I'm taking this uh, virus thing seriously since I'm 67, and that makes me a member of a high risk group. And I'm not paying. I'm not uh, gonna. Uh, I'm gonna take this seriously because I've already had one friend die. I don't know, he didn't die from the coronavirus, but uh, it's all types of junk going on. A lot of people dying. I don't like it. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to take it. Uh, you know, I'll be okay, but I, my wife wouldn't be. <laughs> and I'll leave my wife alone. So today uh, I'm going to uh, show, um, I'm going to letter page 55. Then I'm going to show you a video of me inking with a um, mechanical pencil, uh, page 42. And it will show you the kind of, uh, uh, it's just the way I draw. Anyway, and then I'll um, show you a, uh, a video of me inking, page 56, the bottom panel. I didn't do the top panels, but bottom panel is the most interesting one. And then I'm going to jump into uh, coloring that page 56 live on screen, not a video, me doing it uh, in Photoshop. That'll take a while. And then if I don't finish it by one o'clock, I'll uh, start up tomorrow morning where I left off. Okay. And then uh, that may be what I do uh, from now on. Um, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, these uh, live streams will be a preview of what's coming up uh, in the published pages. So I might not show you lettering anymore because that would tell you what the dialogue is. And, you know, it's like the old, uh, remember uh, the natural where uh, the, the, uh, the wham, uh, whammer, was talking to all the people at the circus and said, you want to see some more? Yeah, hey, come to Chicago, buy a ticket. Well, you don't have to buy a ticket. All you have to do is go to my uh, website, blueboybrown.com, and you can see it. And it's for free. So I am going to uh, start a Kickstarter campaign, maybe at the beginning of June, run all the way through June. And I'm going to have all types of cool things uh, uh, 
that are in addition to the print thing. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna experiment with my phone. This is a nice phone. It's a Samsung S9. It's not the latest uh, version, but it still works just beautifully. And uh, I uh, place it on this thing I made. I made this thing. Um, I can't really show you stuff. So, you know, my laptop ain't doing that. Uh, and I, um, I bring this down so it's level, my drawing board. And I got all this pastel paper that I've, that I've collected and used. And then I'm going to uh, uh, stream a um, video of me doing these uh, drawings that are very much like um, those little drawings I showed you before, you know, these things. I did them with Prismacolor art sticks. And uh, colored pencils are cool, except you have to keep on sharpening them. I hate sharpening pencils. So I've got um, these things. 24 count. I got on Amazon yesterday, and I got some more of them. And so... Um, And so, I lost my screen over here. I'm monitoring this. Yeah, I'm monitoring this. Yeah, I'm monitoring this over on the uh, tablet. Uh, make sure it's coming through. It's not coming through. No. Oh, well, we'll see. Started my, restarted my router. Uh, we can see. Nothing's happening. Am I stop? Uh, see what's going on. Looking for networks, but I yeah, my networks are on. Okay, so uh, okay. Stuff is not good enough. Okay. Okay, it's live on YouTube. So, ah, anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, think seriously about a, a print edition of this comic book. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, see, I'm an amateur. Oh, well. So um, that's what I'm going to do. So I might as well get started. Oh, well, let me give a shout out to, uh, I bought, oh, I went on uh, line last night and I bought myself a comic book at um, Comicsology by a guy named Tom Carter. And I, I like this comic book. 
about a guy who loves his family and he becomes a superhero. Well, that's what superheroes do. They love their families. If you don't love your family, how can you be a superhero? So go get yourself a copy of this. It looks good. And I like the way the guy, uh, his uh, coloring does not overcome his drawing. That's one of the big deal with me, is that coloring should enhance drawing, not uh, be, be the star. Uh, it should blend together real nicely. So go get yourself one of those, okay? Let me see. And then I'll, uh, let me see if I can share. Um, my application window. Oh, I'm, I gotta open this up. Okay, I'm gonna open up. Uh, lettering page 55, yes. Lettering page 55. Put it over here so I can actually see what's going on. There we have it. There we have it. I'll share that. So if you haven't seen, then uh, gifted with seeing me. Um, this takes about 26 minutes. It's not overly complex. I did yesterday's pages, page 55, and now I'm going to letter it. And I'm going to once again demonstrate how I do my lettering, which is simply I do word balloons on the fly. I uh, don't. Um, I don't worry about. Uh, I don't worry about uh, uh, making a, a library of word balloons because uh, that drives me nuts trying to find the word balloon that says you're going to fit there. I really do a custom job. And so that's what I'm doing. And so get started, baby. I started? Yep, I'm sorry. Minute into it, and uh, I'm setting up uh, my, oh yeah, I'm setting up my. Um, First layer, which I label uh, panel one, balloon one. And I believe I have two balloons in that top panel. And it's a little cartoony up there, but uh, when you got a long shot like that, uh, you can get a little simple. The important thing over there is that middle horse got to be nice. Kind of nice. Told you I spent a lot of time at Calder Racecourse in Gulfstream Park getting my chops uh, in the horse anatomy. And there's an English horse artist whose name starts with a B. And I'm going to find it right now. I've got an entire collection of his uh, it's uh, George Stubbs. Yep. George Stubbs. I forgot. Yeah, I forgot. George Stubbs wasn't the was it? Yeah, Stubbs is a wonderful uh, horse artist. Yeah, lovely stuff. And so uh, uh, he has an entire, uh, he made an entire um, anatomy of horses uh, collection of prints back in the late 18th century. And I've got them all. I got them off of art store. I'm a college teacher, and so I get uh, free access to this art store database. And uh, I uh, found them years ago around the time I was going to call it a race course in Gulfstream Park, taking photographs of race horses and going out to horse country here in uh, Florida and, uh, and taking pictures of horses around the place where my wife used to go do for horse riding. I, I was not much of a horse rider when I was a kid. I fell off a lot of horses. But she's the horse, she's the equestrian in the family. Doesn't do it much anymore. It's kind of a certain point where uh, unless you're John Wayne, you're getting paid for it. Uh, 
or you're like my cousin Roger, who has a horse farm and has gorgeous horses. He's about my age, uh, but you know he's grew up around all that stuff. Where I was, I was, I was a transplanted farm kid to the city. Uh, we left the farm. I think when I was five years old. Anyway, horses, horses and dogs, and two most beautiful creatures got into me. Horses you can't have in the house, dogs you can, thank God. Though you know in the in the Middle Ages, in the time before, uh, yeah, back when uh, people uh, uh, depended upon uh, their cow, the cow uh, slept in the kitchen. If you had a kitchen, the cow slept inside the house. Why? Because you couldn't let the cow, for one thing, in the freezing winter, can't have the cow die. And have the cow, cow uh, freeze to death, and somebody might steal your cow. So the cow uh, must uh, in the morning it must have been horrible. I hope you they could uh, housebreak the cow. Maybe they house uh, broke the cow the way you housebreak dogs. Anyway, Paul is saying let's get our job to our jobs now. And uh, if you look at that, the um, lettering is 34 point, which is kind of big. But the reason I do that is because I, when I was doing my research for getting this all together and learning how to, uh, I'm an old WordPress aficionado, but when I was getting uh, my uh, comic uh, site together, do a lot of research. And I noticed that a lot of people who did uh, web comics uh even though they uh, you know they started out on the web and then went into print and uh, now they do both and everything everybody does that um their type was so small you couldn't read it on a phone maybe you could read it on a a, a desktop because you could always increase the a size but on a phone it's just impossible to read that's why i make mine a little bit bigger so that if you're on a phone you can read that without um having to put on the you know get the magnifying glass out which i will um i might modify later on because um might modify it later on because um, if I go to print, I can uh, have smaller uh, uh, print. Uh, I, can have, I can have smaller type points, maybe down to 28 instead of 34. And, uh, and which means I'll have to do some rewriting. I'll have to add some uh, stuff, stuff that I took away. Because since I had to have the uh, lettering, larger i couldn't have lettering everywhere i couldn't have balloons just hiding all the, the, the artwork so i uh i had to get down to really editing the uh just the essentials of the dialogue So what I do is, as you can see, I, um, I make one primitive shape, an ellipse, and then I keep, I copy it, and then I paste it several times, line it up, and then use the Pathfinder tool, which is over there on the left, the bottom uh, uh, toolbox, uh, right over here. Uh, that's where I um, that's where I blend those primitive shapes, and I'm able to make uh, myself a little bit of a, a word balloon there. And it can be the absolutely perfect shape 
than I want it to be. I can even after I get the uh, text in there, I can uh, add to that word balloon and modify it by just copying, I mean, pasting another primitive shape in there, laying it over the word balloon, and uh, using the Pathfinder tool to to join them. And you know, uh, I don't want to call that thing. I am not an illustrator uh, expert. My degree is in pain and printmaking. I'm, the illustrator was no big deal when I was in college. In fact, I'm not sure they had it. When I was in college, yeah. Most of the time I was in college, uh, uh, I was using a typewriter to get all my papers done. It was until I got out of graduate school, they uh, got a Macintosh lab at Pratt Institute, which I used for a while for doing something. I don't know what it was. But it wasn't for graduate school. I remember doing my graduate thesis on a Remington or a Smith Corona or something like that, an electric type right at least. But uh, I used an awful lot of whiteout. Shout out to Mac Nesmith's uh, mommy. That's so all I probably will uh, nudge that word balloon over on the right, make it a little bit bigger. I won't like that. After these two word balloons, it's just uh, narration boxes. Because I narrate this in the third person. You know, I wrote the uh, novel in the first person in uh, Blue Boy's voice. There was a certain point in the comic where I absolutely had to go inside the house of Mrs. Hartman and show what was going on there. Well, Blue Boy's not going to know what, how that, what happened there. And it was just so important to have her say, what in Sam Hill? It's that nosy old man for the dance. What can he want? Well, Blue Boy could never know that. So I abandoned the uh, first person and rewrote the whole dang thing in the, uh, uh, I guess, the third person or second person uh, narrative. I don't know uh, what the proper term for that is. But anyway, I have a narrator. An omni voice, a guy who knows everything. Who uh, is privy to all the things that are going on there. I always make my all the boxes, all the word balloons, and all the uh, narration balloons. I always make sure they have a three point stroke around it, big enough so you can actually see it. And then I make sure, and I, I'll probably go over this this afternoon when I start doing uh, the coloring of uh, page 56 live. I'll show you how I mask all my borders, which I've seen other people on like YouTube showing you how you mask it using the fancy way on. Um, Photoshop, but I don't do it the fancy way. I just set it up manually. And I can tweak it out of think a little bit better than that. So what I want to do is I don't want to have any uh, stroke lines around the uh, in the uh, borders for all the uh, panels. I want to have, I don't want them to be competing with all the stroke lines that are around the uh, the word balloons and the dialogue boxes, the narration boxes. Yeah, we slipped on some work gloves and went at it. wonder how Artie Simic would have uh, 
would have thought about Illustrator doing lettering in Illustrator. When I did my first comic, I, my first couple of comics, uh, it was all um, hand lettered with the rapidograph. It wasn't a whole lot of fun, and I wasn't particularly great at it. I could have been a lot, a lot better with my uh, copy of TV series somewhere around here. Oh yeah, here it is. Here it is. And uh, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad for a twenty-year-old kid who'd only uh, done his first. Comic thing a year before wasn't too bad. I stippled in this old this old comic that I did back in 1973. Every place that I was going to have zipatone, I stippled millions and millions of stipples, stipple, 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 stipple with a little um, small rapidograph because Rick Barry, who was uh, also at, at in uh, Colorado, uh, there he lived there. Uh, he said, "Zipatone's cheap," and I took it seriously. But I'm kind of glad I did because it looked better uh, with uh, stippling than it would have with Zipatone. And uh, so I became a uh, a real uh, I became really good at stippling. Yeah. And uh, the the I was pretty good. I not I wasn't too bad at the level. Yeah. Uh, what if Dale Luciano will ever <clears throat> come in from the cold and uh, see what I'm doing now? He wrote about me in 1985 and said that I was uh, uh, looked like I was a major talent, but I. Uh, had unfortunately left uh, to become a fine artist. Now I've come back, and I, I wrote him a, a, a letter some time back, but I didn't get a response. So, uh, you know, he's retired. He's a, a professor emeritus at the University of Oregon. Now. He's a few years older than me. Uh, when he wrote this uh, uh, back in 1985, uh, he was uh, he's a theater guy. Who likes comics? Well, there's a lot of uh, similarities between theater and comics, especially since, um, well, at least movies, not so much theater, though the the structure of theater and the structure of movies are extremely similar, and that you have to uh, introduce the characters pretty much the same way, called exposition. And then you have to develop each character as you go along. I got nine. I got three books with this particular family in it, uh, so I've got time to. Uh, I've got time to do the grits and grits. Hello, grits and grits. Oh, let me look at the comments. Somebody said, yeah, "Okay, hello, grits and grits. Hello." I don't see it here. Hmm. On there. Uh, somebody named Grits and Grits said, uh, hello, hello, and I say, hello, hello. I feel like the Beatles. Hello, hello. There it is, there it is. Wait a second, this, these things are so delayed. Grits and Guts, oh, hello, Grits and Guts. Welcome. Tell all your buddies about me. Um, and uh, yes, I'm going to do this every day. I've got nine books that I'm doing. This is the first book. I'm up to page, this is page 55. I'm going to work on page 56 also. 
and um, I'm just going to um, just, you'll see the evolution of what I'm doing. I uh, was a underground comics artist back in the 70s. Um, I, uh, uh, I finally got published. Uh, I got it, you know, the, the underground comics thing came up, it became a big thing around 66, 67 with Zap Comics and stuff like that. And um, they, uh, 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 in 73, though, there was a, a, a Supreme, Supreme Court ruling. Great. I, I love the fact that you work on it. Work on it. Work on it. Uh, look at a lot of movies. Look at a lot of movies and, uh, uh, and uh, read uh, some, uh, read some really good short stories. Notice how they develop the plot and everything. That's what I've been doing for years and years and years. But uh, they um, had a, a in, in 73, they had a, a Supreme Court ruling on obscenity. Which uh, uh, underground comics were pretty raunchy. So uh, uh, right around the time they had it, that's when I was working on my comic. So by the time I got out to San Francisco and sat in a in a in Gilbert Shelton's office for an afternoon, he said, "You know, if we had, this thing hadn't happened, you'd get this thing published real easily." But uh, good luck because uh, everything's up in the air, and. Uh, he was real sweet to me. He was just a real nice guy. I got to watch him do a Furry Freak Brothers uh, comic strip. So I know exact. I remember every detail of uh, his work. Now, now I'm putting in the um, copyright symbol. I've done so. I I put in here. Uh, he uh, puts on some work gloves and he gets at uh, and he gets at it. His job is known as a swamper, clearing brush so the wagons can get through. And now I got finished with that. And I'm putting in my copyright notice at the bottom. I do that for every page in the webcomic. Um, so everything is uh, legal. And I, um, um, no matter what happens, uh, wh where this image goes, you can't control the world. And if you try to, you drive yourself nuts. Uh, it has my uh, a little advertisement for it at the bottom. And I think everybody does that, they should. And then I, um, you're into zombies? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> if this coronavirus thing uh, keeps on going, everything's gonna look like a zombie. And then we got an attack of the monster hornets and stuff like that. Do our, our lives are becoming a, a dadgum uh, horror movie. Yeah. Who'd have thunk it, man? I hope this whole thing uh, blows over soon. Uh, or we figure out some way to get the economy open and to shelter in all the vulnerable, vulnerable people like me. Uh, I have. Uh, I used to visit some old, couple of old ladies, little Italian grandmothers, every sat Friday and Saturday morning, and um, and they. Um, now the copyright. Uh, I will. I'll do that. I'll. I'll talk about the copyright process in just a second. I'll, I'm going to uh, go into this. Um, I used to um, uh, visit these old ladies, and now you can't visit any any old folks. They're uh, sequestered in their room. They can't even leave their room. This place that they live, which I'm not even going to mention them because I don't have any right to talk about uh, uh, people without their permission. I can tell you that I visit some old ladies, but you know. Uh, yeah, this is the 40-second uh, delay. Yeah, I think there is. Because I'm watching it on uh, on YouTube uh, and on Facebook on a phone and a tablet. Yeah, yeah that's so I don't do this. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, they're, uh, they're taking this thing very seriously because there are a lot of most of the people that are dying are dying in nursing homes. Uh, uh, that's the majority of people who are dying are dying who are very, very old, have a lot of complicated uh, uh, issues with their health, and we should be really uh, uh, taking care of those people. And uh, we'll see what the heck happens. Uh, this is all out of our control. Anyway, um, 
Uh, can you talk about how you go through the copyright process? In the, in the, the copyright laws are set up right now so that um, everything you do, no matter what you do, has a common law copyright on it, which is enforceable. Uh, somebody uh, steals your work and you've got a copyright uh, 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 notice on it, especially if you have a copyright notice on it, you can take them to court. You can formally uh, do a copyright notice, a copyright form that you can get from the Library of Congress. And you uh, can send that in. So it's covered even though you uh, haven't uh, done it officially. Uh, but it's also um, uh, done officially with forms and everything. Copy law, right law was broadened back in the 70s or 80s. So um, you, ha you have every right to, to, your, to your work. And copyrights, uh, copyrights, I think, last, uh, uh, they may last forever, though. Uh, yeah, no, copyrights last for 27 years. And then after, and then they can be re, uh, they can be renewed for another 27 years. And I believe after that, and in some places they can uh, be renewed a third time, but after a certain time, they go into the public domain. Everything that's done before 1923 is in the public domain, no matter who owned it. So if you see a, a, a Tom Mix uh, Western from uh, the 19, uh, the, uh, 100 years ago, 1920, it's in the public domain. You can do anything you want to with it. There's the uh, finished output as a ping file. It's about a megabyte, but if you, uh, when you put it into WordPress, they're going to compress the file. If you start out with a really crisp ping file, and I use a uh, eight color ping file, works just fine. Uh, and um, it's nice. Uh, and then I, I import it there. Yeah, my mom, what do you mean? Yeah, my mom. <laughs> Which one is grit? Which one is guts? So, your is your mom involved in uh, making your uh, graphic novel? So now I'm finished with that. So now I'm going to show. Ah, uh, let me see. See, that's how ugly. Uh, now I'm going to show a um, oh a video of me doing the. Uh, Page 42. I show you how uh, very curse, uh, what a cursory uh, uh, image I start out with. What I do is I, I do everything in my, in a little sketchbook that I can carry it around with me all the time. And then I scan it, blow it up on a laser printer, you know, gang it up. Uh, and then I trace it onto uh, a piece of bristle board uh, and put carbon paper underneath. And I, I, at one time I was putting graphite on the back of the, the print, but that's a, a, a lot of uh, trouble. I found out that the gra carbon paper worked pretty nicely. And it's the carbon paper you use in the old days when you, we had to water Everybody did everything on a typewriter. Anyway. So now this is how I ink a um, using the mechanical pencil. A number two B uh, Bic mechanical pencil that you can buy at CVS, which is kind of cool. You don't have to go to an art supply store to get something. You don't have to get a, an expensive art pencil. And you never have to... Uh, You're gonna have to sharpen it. So this is what I do. It's dark enough, and I, I think in this video, I, I think I learned my. Uh, this is I learned the hard way that I'm covering up a lot of this stuff, and I'll try to fix that later on. Maybe I, I uh, realize that as I go along, <clears throat> that I'm covering it up.
being a lefty, that happens all the time because we have a tendency to curve our wrist around everything. Anyway, it's dark enough so that when you scan it and then put it into Photoshop, you can adjust the levels and the contrast. You do it all in levels. You don't do it in brightness and contrast. Uh, so that you get white paper, black line. And you can erase it on the fly. And, of course, those things will happen. And so what I do is I draw kind of the classically way. Oh, your mom is at risk for, yeah. Yeah, so protect your mom. That's so difficult when you're living with your parent, grandparents or your parents. Everything you do has to be predicated upon the fact that you're going to come home and everybody you come into contact with, now they're in contact with them because it's uh, the family is a unit. And so you have to protect your mom. Um, who was it? Yeah, I was watching some uh, guy in a, in a podcast saying, my parents are living with me. Uh, and uh, they're taking care of my kids while I'm working. Uh, so I have to make sure that uh, even though I'm in really good shape, I can't do anything that would uh, harm my kids, I mean, my, my, my parents. And he's also kind of happy that there's maybe a chance that the coronavirus doesn't have a major effect upon children. And they don't seem to be able to transmit it to adults. And that would mean that there's no reason to keep schools um, online. You could uh, go back to school in the fall. And maybe they'll figure that out. As you can see, this is uh, the first time I did this. And so I hadn't gotten used to the idea that uh, I'm hiding <laughs> what I'm doing. I'll get, I'll, I'll figure that out in the middle of this. I'm, I'm, I probably look at this and say, "Wait a second, I'm too tight." Anyway, what I do is I do a contour drawing, and then over the contour drawing, I start doing, um, I start putting in the uh, the values using line. And the cross con using hatching and cross hatching for contour line. So uh, Grandpa is getting himself a new wife here. Grandpa's had a lot of wives since he became a widower after having two boys after his wife got the consumption. And he kept trying to find a, wa a woman who'd take care of his kids while he went out and cut, cut down trees. I think I, I'm starting to figure out that I'm hiding the lines. Hopefully I'm figuring that out. I just do a contour drawing and then I do all the embellishment. And what I've found cool is that with a uh, Mechanical pencil, this mechanical pencil, not just any mechanical pencil. It has to be a big mechanical pencil. And the reason you want it to be a big mechanical pencil and only use big uh, refills is because they make their graphite in France. So the um, graphite that was found that replaced lead, um, uh, pencil leads, but they're not lead anymore, the graphite found in Europe. So the French got a, whoever does the leads for uh, Bic in France gets them probably from that original graphite mine. I hope they don't run out. I think I'm figuring it out that I'm, uh, I don't need to hide everything. Don't get so tight. So everything is a uh, everything here is a uh, contour line, and then you'll see that I just go into it and I embellish everything. I think this was the first one I did, and I don't understand why I didn't uh, do anything until I got to like page 
54. But I don't know. Cool thing about this is that you, um, I'm kind of a pencil guy. I did a lot of inking when I was a kid. Uh, I'm talking about 1920. And, uh, but you, uh, if you make a, a boo boo, you have to cover it up with uh, white out. And uh, or wash or something like that, some white wash or something like that. And this is so much easier. Anything that's easier, I'm going to do it. Anything that makes my life a little bit less complicated, I'm going to do it. Once I get into this, get all this contour done, then I'm going to start uh, doing all the stuff so that you actually get a sense of shadow. And when I color it, I don't use a whole lot of color in this panel. It's mostly grays and browns. Put, uh, I put Grandpa in a white suit, but he's got a sort of a beige hat. Everybody wore a hat. This is 1914. Everybody had a hat. It wasn't until John Kennedy became president that we abandoned hats for some reason. Uh, he didn't wear a hat, so everybody stopped wearing hats. Aberdasheries went out of business. Everybody had a hat now, but now everybody wears a cap. You know, the hat business is back in. You know, I almost bought a cowboy hat last fall, but I didn't. I was over in a, uh, a horse supply store last uh, fall. I was looking at their cowboy hats, which are not unreasonable. You get one for 70 bucks or something like that. But uh, you can buy them online too and everything. They buy Stetson and other places. Some are really, really nice. You feel like you're a character out of Dallas soap opera. Thank you for saying this is powerful. I hope. Uh, wait till I get to uh, uh, page 56. Uh, I start to go to town on page 56. Because page 56 is where Blue Boy. Who uh, is a twelve-year-old, six-foot-eight giant? He's not sick. Doctor says he's not sick. He's, this isn't giantism. He's just a big kid. And I and uh, and I, and this is actually based upon members of my family. You should always uh, write about the things you know. And uh, my father told me many, many, many tales about our family. When I was a kid, my like, dad was a great storyteller. So if I uh, tell a story with any uh, uh, sense of uh, you know, that it's cool, it's partly because my dad was really good at it. Uh, my dad uh, didn't have any of the advantages I did. He grew up in the Depression, had to go out and work. There's nothing you can do about it. Before the Pell Grant in 1973, you couldn't go to school. Unless you, um, well, you could use the GI Bill. 
but he got married and uh, he had to raise a family and everything. And even though he did take some classes, he was a GI Bill. Hey, families take precedence. And so that's the way it was. He could have had a lot of things going on with him if he uh, had more advantages. But hey, that's life. I'm a, a product of his, uh, you know. Wasn't too impressed about me wanting to be an artist, but that's the way parents are. They say, hey, they think that everybody's going to be Van Gogh. No, 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 no. You don't have to be Van Gogh. Become a, a, a school teacher. I became a school teacher eventually. After all the way through college and getting a master's degree and everything, I go off and become a high school teacher, which was a good deal. You know? Um, If you give up the idea, uh, now I think I'm going to start the hatching. Yeah, yeah I'm going to go. Um, if you give up the idea of becoming a, uh, some kind of big deal in the art world, which is not something that happens to everybody, it doesn't have to happen for you to be a really happy as an artist. Uh, especially now, this this is a great time to be an artist because now with the World Wide Web and the delivery means in the hands of the artist. Dang. I guess I, I'm publishing everything myself. I had a publisher back in the 70s, but uh, I'd rather be the publisher. I'd rather be the guy who ha has full control over all the content. Now, this is what I'm doing. Um, I'm uh, mainly influenced by Leonardo's lefty, left-handed uh, hatchet. I'm a lefty. Love Leonardo. But who doesn't? And he um, and he uh, um, always had this um, upper left to, right, uh, to lower right slant to his uh, hatching. And that's why you can tell it's Leonardo a number of times. There's a, a, a big controversy over a, a drawing that Leonardo did called uh, La, La Principa Bella uh, that he did of uh, a Sforza princess. And one of the reasons they think it's Leonardo's is because he, uh, it's all done as a lefty. And nobody who was his follower was a lefty. So you can see what I'm doing. Now I'm starting to get into it. You don't have to sharpen the pencil. Well, self-publishing is just a matter of um, finding an audience and uh, getting enough uh, people um, interested in your project so that you can do a, a Kickstarter campaign. And I've been doing a little bit of a, uh, I've been listening to some people who are uh, experts at Kickstarter. This may be a really good time to do a Kickstarter campaign because uh, a lot of people are not doing Kickstarter campaigns right now. And uh, maybe this is a good time. It's not maybe not so crowded. So I get this cursory kind of hatching going on. Get your finger out of there, Dave. But don't bear down too hard on the, uh, close to the tip. This enables me to get a sense of shadow without having to use any tone smudging and all that other stuff. Well, I'm an old drawing teacher, so one of the things that young artists do is they they'll draw and then they'll smudge it with their fingers that that you'll just get the same 40 percent uh gray all the time you're just not gonna be able to put enough graphite onto your paper to actually do that and also you're going to smudge all your lines better to use hatching you get the same effect but it's clear and uh it doesn't um, um and you can get a huge complete range of value, which is real important in uh, making art. 
usually, unless it's not your uh, your thing for that piece, piece, you want to have a full range of value because it enables you to uh, establish a uh, foreground, a middle ground, and a background. And I try to do that a lot. And maybe maybe because you're on here, uh, Grit and Guts. And thank you. Uh, please subscribe to my page uh, and tell all your friends about me. And especially those of you who want to self-publish. Because um, then you can follow my, uh, my uh, little adventure here. And if I'm successful, it's uh, rinse and repeat. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Do what I did. And uh, let's see if it's... Uh, it's it, these, this is not rocket science. This is not calculus. This is not taking physics. This is just uh, producing really, really high quality stuff. Just bust your tail on it. Edit and re-edit. Oh, when I did this, this is a 148 page graphic novel. I worked a year and a half on the, uh, no, I'm, uh, 11 months just on the sketches in a sketchbook. And then I, um, uh, and then uh, I, uh, right at the end, just before I, about a month before I decided to go live in this, uh, which was, I decided January 1st to do, start this, I uh, redid the first seven pages completely. Uh, six or seven pages. I just redid them completely because that's the soul of uh, writing. The soul of writing and comics is to rewrite and redraw anything that isn't up to snuff. Just do it. Take your time, especially if you're self-publishing. You don't have a, a, an editor on your case saying, hey, where's the work? Where's the work? You can do it on your own. And then you, um, you make sure that every one of those things has something to draw that, um, draw the reader in on that page. Not every panel is going to be a masterpiece. But you'd like to have at least one uh, one panel on each page that will um, kick tail. And draw the uh, viewer in and, and make them interested in the story. And then you want to write a story. You, you, it really takes a lot of practice and looking at a lot of stories. Read really good short story artists. Um, I love Flannery O'Connor because she's weird. She's a really wonderful person. I actually have an audio of her uh, reading her story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, which is a macabre murder story. Uh, uh, about a, a murder, a serial killer called the Misfit kills an entire family. Oh, but the way she writes, the way she writes, makes it so so uh, inevitable this that this horrible thing's going to happen. Uh, which is go right goes into your zombie thing. Yeah, before you get funding, work on your art skills. Uh, get them up and. Uh, um, uh, find a, just look at look at Rembrandt man there's a there's a uh, uh, look up Rembrandt paintings and etchings there's a a, a a site called Rembrandt paintings and it has all his paintings and all his etchings and all this stuff is coming straight out of my uh, uh, my devotion to Rembrandt the way that I'm uh, uh, hatching and cross hatching everything I get that straight out of some of Rembrandt's uh, really, really developed prints. Which cool, cool thing about being a uh, using this pencil and everything is that all the things you can do in an etching, I'm doing. If I want to press harder, that's uh, a time when you leave the plate longer in the acid. When you get lighter, it's when you have a lighter, uh, a long, uh, a state in which you don't put the uh, plate in the acid is long, but I don't have to mess around with fumes and stuff like that. Though I do do, uh, I still uh, do uh, etchings. 
But uh, right now, <coughs> I spent several years going back to uh, doing etchings, which I absolutely adore. But this thing here is uh, uh, it's going to take over my life, which I want it to. Uh, this is going to take uh, me at least a dozen years to get this um, series out. I've got it written. That's the important part. I've got it written. It's I know it's a I know what it's about. I know I'll do a lot of rewriting, but the the, the rough part, the, the knowing what's going to happen to the characters, that's done, and that's real important. Because then you can plan out, and it's real important to have a script. It's real important to have a script go, and there are lots of places on the uh, on the web that actually have comic book scripts, and so you can look at them and tell how uh, people do them. Because what I do in my scripts, and I guess I'll I'll show one of my scripts soon, is I um, I describe what's in that scene. Uh, as a as a, a descriptive uh, thing in the, uh, verbally, because uh, that's what I do when I draw. Anyway, I uh, I'm in a real eccentric. I I know how to draw in a classical way. I know how to do it uh, from primitive shapes and do another thing, which I kind of got from Raphael. Uh, I noticed he was doing that, and I started doing. It. I said, "Wait a second, this is this is what it, uh, these teachers were were not telling me." Uh, and uh, but I also before that, when I was a kid, I would just draw lines, all what I now know were just contour lines, and I didn't have the chops to do all these this cross hatching. What I'm doing here is I'm getting as sloppy as I want to be because I've been drawing for 60 years. I started drawing when Eisenhower was in his next to last year of his presidency, 1959. So I can I can I can fix almost anything. If I screw up, I know I can bring it back. Well, if over in the right, yeah, I knew I was going to be able to do that because I what I'm doing right then is I'm thinking I've got in my mind one of Rembrandt's uh, uh, areas where he's used uh, hatching and cross hatching, and I'm just saying okay, I'm going to look at make it look like that because we all come from somebody else's hard work. Nobody uh, becomes an artist and uh, does this completely on their own. Uh, you're fooling yourself. And you think that you're not channeling somebody else's thing. If you're uh, using theatrical lighting, you're channeling uh, Caravaggio. Everybody is. He's the most influential artist in the history of art. That theatrical lighting, which is long before theatrical lighting was ever thought of, he just said, hey, you see that light coming out of the window? Oh! Ah! I'm going to do that. And he didn't get it from, he didn't, it didn't uh, come out of his head like Venus coming out of the head of Zeus. He got it from Raphael. Raphael's transfiguration and a little bit of things going on in uh, uh, Leonardo's uh, Virgin of the Rocks and the Virgin of St. Anne. They have a little bit of tenebrism in it too. And then he just, he takes it to another level. And then after that, everybody's working on like it. So everybody who uh, messes around with uh, uh, theatrical lighting, any type like that, is uh, doing that. But uh, me, I, I go after uh, Rembrandt because uh, he's just closest to my soul. I love him. It's all me hard. So that's what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to set up uh, all this cross-hatching where it's – Looks kind of organic, not uh, not as if it came out of a, of a machine or was uh, something from an algorithm. It looks like it was done by a hand. I'm really into the analog. I love the digital world. Ooh, man, the digital world has made my life so much easier. But uh, still, uh, there's something about paper and pencil. I know. I finally figured out. Hey. Why don't you let people see what you're doing? So the, the okay, I started uh, with uh, yeah, 
Yeah, get into cross hatching. Uh, look at Rembrandt. Uh, look at um, look at Michelangelo's head of a satyr. Uh, man, that is a that is a um, a workshop in hatching and cross hatching. His is perfect. Uh, uh, there'll never be another Michelangelo probably. Uh, but hey, at least we got him. Uh, but uh, hatching and cross hatching that's just everything. And you can just do anything with uh, hatching and cross hatching. Maybe I'll have to put up a couple of uh, pages where I really go to town and uh, in, in hatching. I'm getting close. I'm having. Okay, I got about three minutes to go. So at that point, I uh, was fairly satisfied with this. I don't know if I did anything else to it, but uh, uh, okay. The world building I'm doing is based upon actually my world building is sort of like uh, Southern Arkansas in 1914. Uh, and the reason I did Southern Arkansas is because I was born there. I was born about 30 miles away from Bill Clinton's birthplace. He's born in Hope. I was born in Camden, which is about 30 miles away from each other. So I know that culture. I know those people, the good, the bad, and the ugly of them. Uh, a lot of good people down there. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's stinkers wherever you go. And uh, hey, that's what makes life sort of interesting. You wish there weren't so many stinkers out there, but there are. And there's nothing you can do about it except not be one of them. But uh, this is about uh, uh, a world of uh, poor people. Everybody's uh, pretty much just getting by by the skin of their teeth. And uh, that's the way it is in most places in the world. And very few people aren't doing that. Especially now, you just look on people in, in uh, food lines uh, for miles and miles and miles. You'd think that uh, wouldn't happen, but it does. And so I'm interested in the lives of people who uh, just get by, just get by. There we go. I think that's it. Yeah, got about uh, ooh, about 15 seconds to go. Okay. Well, goody, goody. Take notes, and let me see. This is uh, finished now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing that. Then I'll go on to the uh, page 56, the bottom of page 56, right here. There we go, put it over here so I can see it. And then I'll share it. There we go. Now let me start this. Okay. So now I do all those things. <clears throat> I've, I've done the contour line drawing. And now I'm uh, 
I'm doing all the things that I used to do when I was inking, but you can feather a line using a mechanical pencil the same way you can with a sable brush. That's the whole point of um, putting in a really um, well-structured contour line. Look at uh, Rembrandt, uh, look at um, Picasso's classical period. Uh, the Vollard suite is 100 etchings that he did for his dealer in trade for uh, Cezanne. He got a Cezanne. Cezanne's by that time were getting expensive, so he wanted this Cezanne. And uh, Vollard says, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Do me a hundred etchings, and uh, I'll, we'll call it even. So he did a hundred etchings, and some of them were really beautiful. But all of them use, um, almost all of them use uh, the um, style he developed just after, just around the time World War I was uh, raging. He didn't fight it because Spain wasn't in the fight. And uh, he was a Spanish citizen. And so uh, he uh, got into uh, Degas and Aang. We should also look at Aang. Ooh, 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 ooh. Aang. Let me put, uh, uh, let me put, uh, let, me, let me do this. Ang's portrait drawings. Ay, 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 ay. Yeah. Look at Ang's portrait drawings. Rembrandt's. Etchings. His drawings are almost all brush drawings. So they're not that... Um, they're not going to teach you that much about comics. But his, uh, his uh, etchings are not drawings per se. But uh, once you get skillful enough, once you get uh, knowledgeable enough about the work that he's doing, you start messing around with pencil. You uh, can imitate what he's doing. That's what I'm doing right here. I'm imitating something that Rembrandt would have done. I know Rembrandt, not tending to be Rembrandt. There's nobody as, as, as wonderful as him. Uh, but uh, still, should only steal from the best stores. If you're gonna if you're gonna be influenced by somebody, be influenced by the best ever. Because uh, the people you there are lots of people in comics who can draw like nobody's business, but uh, uh, they're also looking at <laughs> they're probably looking at Rembrandt and uh, Michelangelo and Raphael and people who and Aang people who could draw so gorgeously and Domier. Oh, look at Domier. Look at Domier. His uh, lithographs are outrageous. I used to be a political cartoonist back in the 70s. Oh, I got a, almost got myself hurt. <laughs> I was doing uh, political cartoons about uh, the local district attorney. And uh, he called up the sheriff and says, I want you to take that boy out in the woods, beat him within the inch of his life, and leave him there. And the sheriff wouldn't do it. Thank God he wouldn't do it. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, uh, the sheriff was a member of the opposing political party. And also uh, an ex-member, uh, an ex 
catcher for the New York Yankees, so he's a good guy. And he wouldn't uh, uh, do what this uh, district attorney wanted him to do. And I won't mention where it happened or anything like that because I'm not interested in a lawsuit. But a lot of crazy things going on in this world. So one of the things that when I was a little 19, 18, 19, I met a guy named Artie Romero. And Artie was uh, uh, the uh, publisher of a really, really high-end comic fanzine named Realm. One of the things that uh, Artie... Artie and I sort of like brainstormed about how to do comics, but Artie was a little bit ahead of me, about a year and a half older than me. And he said, always do only what you need to get that image across. Don't do any more. Make it as, as, uh, as economical as you can possibly make it, which is why I do the simple contour line and then I only do what I have to do to get that idea across. Because remember, this is going to be colored. I don't want the color to uh, interfere with the drawing, but I also don't want the drawing to be so uh, uh, complex that the color is useless. So that happens occasionally, like the little page 42 we just saw. Uh, I didn't need, need to use much color there. I did pretty much everything I needed to do. In uh, I did almost everything I needed to do in the um, in the hatchet. By this time, I had figured out that if I put my camera to the right. And then, then uh, tilt it. So I got the entire image in, but I also was looking sort of underneath that lefty thing going on. Uh, I could get a whole lot better image. This is all a learning process for me. I used to teach television production, but we didn't do anything like this. Yeah, if I, if I, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, if I did uh, political, uh, if you did political cartooning and the politics, politicians were mad at you, yeah, you, you, uh, you hit, uh, hit them where they live. I was getting all my, uh, dirt on these guys from a, uh, from the, uh, the uh, public defender of uh, this county. And he knew everything was going on. He knew all the dirt. And so uh, uh, I think he's the one who warned me. He says, uh, you better uh, lay low for a while because uh, district attorney's after you. And this attorney didn't know he was the one who was uh, giving me all uh, my dirt. And all those guys have long since passed away, I believe. This is 50 years ago. About 50 years ago. Yeah, about 46 years ago. They're all long gone. We'd like the world to be perfect, but it's not going to happen. It's too many variables. All right, yeah. Good old Blue Boy Brown's nose. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I won in the win in the end. Uh, what happened is that the, uh, um, yeah, I think the uh, the uh, uh, from then on uh, the. Uh, Opposing political party controlled the district attorney's office for a long time. I think I did win in a, long, in a way. I'm of the opinion that there has to always be a a, uh, a tension, a, uh, a going back and forth 
between the two wings of the political spectrum. Because they're both right in a way, but they're both wrong in a way. They, they're not, they're, neither of them have got it, got it all right. So they always have to be uh, in a fight with each other. And actually, actually probably good for the country. You don't want everything, you don't want everything the Republicans want. You don't want everything that they want to happen because it's part of the Republicans that are not, uh, <laughs> they don't care about uh, poor people. Some of them don't. And uh, but you don't want all the Democrat uh, uh, stuff to uh, get because then you have no businesses. <laughs> this is a crazy part of, uh, of uh, the Democrat Party, too. And so, you know, I don't think the, the Constitution wasn't built so that one party would uh, rule forever. But anyway, that's uh, I was. Uh, it's been a long time since I was a political cartoon, so I try to stay out of that now. But it's just policy's gotten too crazy. No matter what you say, someone's going to get mad at you. And I just want to do comics. Well, I will say, uh, when I print my uh, comic, it's going to be printed in the United States of America. It's be printed in Illinois. All comics, for many, many years, probably still are, are printed in Galesburg, Illinois. And I think that's real close to where I'm printing. I'm not printing in China. But a lot of people were printing in China for many years. Uh, sorry, not anymore. Not me. You're in Massachusetts, man. I got a lot of friends in Massachusetts. I um, uh, I was at the um, I was at a dinner with my in-laws. Many of twenty, uh, yeah, maybe twenty-something years ago. And I mentioned that my uh, my best buddy from graduate school uh, was from Massachusetts, and I mentioned the town. And uh, my sister-in-law said, "That's where I grew up." I said, "Oh, really?" And I mentioned uh, the man's name, and that his uh, father was uh, a high school teacher. He said, "Mister," I won't mention that name either. Mister, who? I, that was, he was my biology teacher. I love him. It's a small world. What a, a small world. I always mention to my friend, I say, you know, my sister-in-law loves your, uh, your dad. I used to like to go up to Massachusetts during the leafing season when the, the leaves turn. What a gorgeous place. I don't like going up to Massachusetts and Vermont during October. And uh, checking into a, a little ho a motel. Used to go up to Bennington a lot. And uh, check into a little uh, motel and just go out in the woods. And uh, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't even think I took uh, photographs or anything like that. I just liked being out in the woods in that absolute gorgeous place. Beautiful, beautiful place. Hey, you know, Boston is the... Uh, is a, a big uh, publishing center. I had friends uh, uh, in Boston. My wife grew up uh, in Andover. So you see, if you do your best to make all the hatching lines distinct, you're pretty much imitating uh, inking. It sure is a lot faster. That's just a great place. To, uh, yeah, I have a friend who went to, got his uh, graphic design uh he got his second master's degree at the University of Massachusetts, and he's doing really well. 
working his tail off, but uh, he's never been un unemployed. He's just a consultant now. Doesn't have uh, to. Uh, no, he, uh, he told me last night. He said, "But I am uh, working my tail off." I said, "You'd be glad you got work." You see, you can imitate all of the actions of a pretty fine line um, brush, and it happens just boom, 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 boom. And it's also a lot like a, um, a crow quill pen. A lot like a crow quill pen. So I used to use crow quill pens uh, too, but uh, this you can erase. You can't erase a crow quill pen. I really go to town on that uh, butcher block table. Yeah, pins are scary. Pins are scary. You just have to. Here's the thing: is is it just a drawing? <clears throat> I think that's why you. Uh, it's real important. I, I like the uh, the way, the kind of setup I've got, where I do everything in a sketchbook and uh, get everything worked out, the composition and everything, and then I scan it in my. Uh, I, I got two scanners. I got an Epson XP uh, 430, which is a uh, letters. Uh, Eight and a half by eleven inch scanner. Then I have a uh, Epson Workforce WF seventy seven twenty, which is eleven by seventeen inches. Which Going on here, according to uh, my, according to my, uh, I think I'm having problems on. Uh, let's see what happens. According to uh, Facebook, <clears throat> I'm having trouble with my feed. Oh, I hope not. Because I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing okay um, in uh, at YouTube. It appears there's some problems with Facebook. Huh. Oh, well. YouTube is still going okay. Let's see what I can do over here. Okay, let's see. Maybe it'll we'll come back in a few minutes. At least where uh, YouTube's going on. Okay. I can't be named for this one. It's Facebook's problem. But uh, um, my, my videos are so you can keep watching videos from Facebook while browsing news feed. Sounds good. Okay. How about that?
Oh well. Shame. Facebook, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're making so much money off this. Okay. Well, at least I'm on Facebook. I mean, on uh, YouTube. Anyway, it's coming along. And I'm uh, dealing with uh, the... Um, let's see one little thing here. Well, what do you think you do with me? Because I'm still okay. Okay, these uh, characters, um, characters of a family of lumberjacks who are loosely based upon. People my dad used to tell me about. There's the end of that. Okay. Okay. And the blue boy, Brown, is a six foot eight, 12 year old. Who is, um, been working as a lumberjack since he was 10 years old when his grandpa got the rheumatism. And they needed him 
to go to work, which happened before the child labor laws. That's what always happened. And so, um, let's see, where am I? 631. I got two more. Uh, 25. Uh, I got another. Why do I have it? Oh, I got it. Okay, that's it. So stop sharing that. For the uh, child labor laws, um, you uh, would uh, go to work when your family needed you. What happened to my dad? But he was old enough to actually do that. Okay, I'll put up, bud. And I'm going up that page that I just inked in Photoshop, and I'll show how I set that whole thing up. Okay, share the screen. Application window. There we are. Well, dude, come on. Huh. I want to be able to see those. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing that and then uh, share it again. Application window. This. Should be able to get the whole thing in. Oh, okay. okay. Uh. okay. But um, uh, I need the. Okay, let's try it this way. How about I share screen? Ah, okay. Eh, whatever works. Okay. So, um, let me show you what I'm up to. Here we have what I had. And if you look real closely, you'll notice there is a texture over the screen. Let me get rid of this tone level layer. And you notice that I have a level called WC right here. That is a scan of a piece of Fabriano Classico rough 300-pound watercolor paper that I scanned. And I lay it in that layer using multiply so that it's transparent, but you also see the texture. Then I lock that thing. That's locked. You lock it. For no other reason. Yeah. Then I have a, uh, then I have my, uh, da 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 da. Let me show you all these things. Then here's my regular layer which I, uh, at the time that I was doing it, I had, I had, uh, I had drawn borders. So here's my, um, and so, um, so I uh, lay it on to a, um, a template that I got from the printer. That tells you where you want things to be. Right there is the edge of the image. And then I place a border on top that enables me to do any of the coloring I want to, that border, uh, you won't see anything in the coloring that, uh, when I go uh, to all this stuff. 
You won't see any of that. And then I open up a tone, put a tone over it, because classically, artists would uh, tone their canvas when they begin painting. So they don't have to deal with the white of the canvas. And then they can lighten the uh, value of anything by, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm simply using uh, the dodge tool to lighten Blue Boy's clothing, at least a part of it, where the light's going to hit. Then a little bit over here, because you want this kind of stand out. It's, he's a swamper, so he's big guy. He gets stronger all the time. In the novel, I talk about how he gets stronger and stronger and stronger each day. Then over here is my uh, Rembrandt Leonardo scribbling of the of the leaves and of the uh, trees and everything. And then I just lay in areas that are going to, uh, and sometimes I have a with the, the Photoshop on still, baby. So I lighten all this up. This is in my tone layer. Down here I have a color layer and a shadow layer on top of that. This is where I'm going to put all the color. This is the tone, which I uh, will uh, use to, um, like, well, let me. And I do all this. And you, what you'll notice is it gives you, I'm using a watercolor brush here. Yes, I should be. No, I'm not. Give me my watercolor brush. No, I want my watercolor brush. Okay. I don't want speech bump brushes. Get that stuff. Ah, uh, watercolor. Big round brush tool, okay. That's what I want. But I don't want it to be 131 pixels. I bring back up here. Go back to the brush. And uh, I wanted, no, I don't want a brush. But, uh, the dodge tool. Yeah. It's a dodge tool. Now I just keep on dodging. Ouch. Anyway, I have to go back to that. Yeah, that's what drive me nuts. Anyway, um, I play around with this, and then I, maybe I'll put in some sky over here. You notice these are very hard edges? Yep, you're going to deal with that. I'll get back to my watercolor brushes in a few minutes. I can mess around with that by smudging it. Which I don't always, I don't have to do it right now. Anyway. 
So then, I'm gonna, okay, now I'm back to watercolor brush, I believe. Okay, now I'm back to my watercolor brush. That's good. So I'm gonna open up my, let me see, artboard. Yeah, this. I well, have to go look for it then. Well, where are you? There. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go This picture's 53. There, picture's 53. Okay. The blue boy brown. 1300. And look for the page 53. Open that thing up. Okay. And that's uh, that's the first page of this. That's the first page of this uh, chapter. Chapter four. So I drag this thing over here to uh, another screen. Set up. And I use uh, the eyedropper tool. To, I'm going to just start with the two boys paint. I have to go down to here. And I go down to color. So I want to mess up my uh, color. Okay, you don't mind, do you? Uh, once that target layer is hidden. No, it's not. Target. Oh, it's not. Okay, I got it. Okay, I understand. Let's see that over there. I got to bring these on back. Okay. So here we are. Okay. So let me uh, reduce the size of that a little bit so I can go ahead and mess with it. And then I start to color it. I hope that Photoshop isn't giving me fits today. No, I don't want to talk to anybody. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm getting it. Okay. So now I'm uh, just roughing in color. Since this is in multiply, as I apply more brush strokes when get a when to deepen the value. It's kind of what I want to do. I might as well do it down here too. Be nice guy. There you go.
And let me see. He's uh, wearing some pair of pants. Down here. Oh, I see. That's why I'm getting mad at this thing. Because the flow is only 55%. I want the flow to be 100%. Okay. Good. That's the way you want it to look. What I'm doing here is I'm doing digital watercolor. Because it looks cool. That's the only reason I'm doing it, because it looks so cool. And every time you uh, apply it again, it's like in regular watercolor. It builds up. You can do this several times. Oh, good. I'm back <clears throat> on Facebook. Well, they should be ashamed of themselves. Okay. And I'll uh, deepen this a little bit. And I get as sloppy as I want to. I do not have to uh, just simply, you know, uh, try to keep within the lines. It's not important. Why? Get my hand tool. Uh. I don't have to stay within the lines because um, it's digital. I can erase it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go after, uh, I guess I'll go after the ground. Yeah. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to get a little bit of the orange ground, uh, ground and then I'm going to go after that. Okay. Because all I'm doing is laying in some flat colors that I'll modify later on using the dodge and the burn tools and also you know, just a knowledge of color theory, how colors blend. What you can find out is, uh, this is what I uh, find kind of fun about this, is that the uh, eventually, if you use the color the way 
the eye conceives things and the way the language of art is set up, which is only set up because that's the way we can see things, you establish a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Everything becomes legible. Is what the color is supposed to do to it. Of course, you're not supposed to do the same thing in, uh, in uh, the drawing. The drawing should be more complex in the foreground, a little less complex in the middle ground, and then simple in the background. Then everything will take care of itself. Yeah, that is kind of weird. Um, it's something that I noticed. Uh, you're saying that my favorite aspect is that you stick to the blues and the browns, but you get so much range. It has a lot to do with to, with um, um, the browns in this are where all the spatial uh, things are going on, where you notice the foreground, the middle ground, the background. But those blues are the areas that I want you to notice. They become the focal area. And I noticed this from uh, studying classical painting, is that you'll notice a, a, a Bruegel. One of my favorite examples is Bruegel's uh, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And it's a very muted landscape except for the plowman's blouse. His uh, arm is red. You gotta look at it. You absolutely have to look at it, which is what he wanted you to do. He wanted you to look at the, uh, the blouse because over there in the sea, at the bottom of the cliff, Icarus is drowning. And that's the whole point of the, the painting, is that Icarus is drowning, and you didn't notice it because no hand leaves the plow because of the death of one man. It's what the whole painting was about. No hand leaves the plow because of the death of one man. How do you get that across using just the language of art because you don't have a, a a narrator like me to tell you go look at that guy he's drowning it's not gonna happen you do it using the visual language so that's gonna work uh i think so yeah using using the visual language of just making sure that uh Nobody notices Icarus because I'm going to put that guy's sleeve as this big red shape. And you're going to look there instead of looking at landscape with the fall of Icarus. Have this on my. See if I have landscape of the fall of Icarus on my. Uh, come on. Better than I have it. Using Macintosh Spotlight to see whether or not I have landscape of the fall of Icarus. I don't think there. Maybe I can look. Over here. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, I'm going to mention something. I might as well uh, show it to you. Um, this is not the uh, best example. This is better. There, lost out. There. Here, I'll, I'm going to show this just real quick. But it's, you know, it's not like the uh, world's ending. I'm going to show this. Oh, there it is. I'm showing you this screen. There it is. I'm glad I just showed the screen. There it is. That's landscape of the fall of Icarus. Uh, right down here, Icarus is drowning, but you don't notice it because you have to look here. Everything here is analogous colors. And then you got this thing here, right here. You're going to look there. You're going to look at all this high contrast activity and everything. Icarus is drowning because no hand leaves the plow because the death of one man. Now, using that, your knowledge of a language of art like that, you can set up any painting, any color situation, so that you have all this color that sort of blends together, and then you got this one loud thing going on here. Now, I've had him take his coat off, but he took his coat off and he's got a white shirt. So the contrast between all this and that white shirt will be the thing that gets your attention. So let me go back and uh, uh, find, uh, find my artboard here. So um, I'm just going to pick a color here. Oh, I was part doing that. Yeah, if you didn't point out uh, the poor Icarus, uh, you'd never notice that he was drowning. And that was the whole point of it. It's like uh, nobody notices that somebody died. Now we do, but uh, you know, a lot of people have died just recently, uh, but uh, most of them are gonna be anonymous. That's the way it is. And Bruegel's saying, get used to it. That's what the medieval uh, uh, saying was saying also. Uh, go and live your life. Uh, nobody's gonna notice whether you lived or died. And uh, what are you gonna do about it? Life in the Middle Ages was rough. Uh, we didn't know anything about medicine. Uh, people thought that cats were the reason why we had the bubonic plague. So they killed the cats, got rid of cats. That's a bad idea. Because cats were actually the, the, uh, one of the bulwarks against the bubonic plague since they killed rats. And it was the fleas on rats that was the... That's why we have the bubonic plague. Ah! So, a lot of good things came from the scientific method. Let's see, go back up here. Get the cardboard and give you some. Uh, uh, I do wish I could get this. These brushes. Yeah, get rid of my brushes right now. I get, need some uh, flesh tone. Good enough. Let's 
So I'll put some flesh on these guys. Might as well, but it's, it's, it's a lot of flesh going on here. Okay, am I still down in the color? Yeah, I'm still in the color. All I'm trying to do right here is lay in these flat areas of color. Don't need any great uh, variations yet. Once I have them all in, then I can start playing around. So I better shut my mouth and get, get on with it. Oh, yeah. I've been using this uh, landscape for a while in my art history classes. And little did I know that uh, it would become so uh, apropos that uh, so many people are dying and uh, there's so many of them that uh, we don't even notice half of them. One of the things I'm doing with this the coloring uh, strategy that I have is that I'm a, uh, I'm a guy who grew up in the 60s. And I started my first comic book I ever read was uh, Zorro. Alex Toth did it. It was like 1957, 1958. Outrageous. Comics. That got me hooked. So being five years old, I didn't exactly have the capacity to go out and get myself my own comics for quite a while. But uh, the way they color before the digital world came in was hit and miss. It also had a lot to do with uh, back of there doing these comics on the same kind of printing presses that are used to print newspapers. And sometimes the register's a little bit off. They'll mess it up. And it's, I don't, it, it wasn't the um, colorist that did it. It wasn't the colors that did it, it was the printer. Uh, because uh, they're on these big rolls and you just make one tiny little mistake and Superman Shield has a misregister and the red's over in the blue and the blue's over in the red and blah, 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 blah. But you know something, I like that. I think there's something cool about that. Yeah. I think there's something cool about that. So um, I don't like to do it too much, but I don't get too upset about it. If there's a little bit over the line, that'd bother me too much. I based my creation of Blue Boy Ooh, a horseman leading zombies through a hilly terrain. That's going to be cool. I want to see that one. I based this guy's face on my roommate in graduate school, a guy named Doug. And he just got one of those faces. I have never known anybody who didn't absolutely like this guy. He's always, everybody likes this guy. And he also has great personality, but he just has one of those faces that you just immediately look at it and say, 
that, that guy's got to be good. He's like Barney Rubble or something like that. Just this, just the nicest person. Well, my uh, Blue Boy Brown looks an awful lot like this guy, a six foot eight version of this guy. So I hope uh, everybody likes my character. They're kind of drawn into it. He's got one of those faces that everybody likes. want to uh, do a little exercise in the foreground, middle ground, background. Go to page eight and nine of Blue Boy Brown. It's the Battle of Gettysburg. There's a very pronounced foreground, middle ground, and background there. Okay, I've got their faces done. It's real. Just barely put it there. Okay. So I'm gonna once again bring him back and uh, play around with that color there in the stand of trees. Gonna cooperate with me? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Well. If you have trouble with foreground, middle ground, and background, I'm a teacher, and I'll uh, just uh, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and then go over to um, Blue Boy Brown by David Greg Taylor on Facebook. Like that. Friend me, David Greg Taylor, and uh, just uh, all you have to do is watch. It, it's just a matter of just looking. Once you look and you understand what the heck's going on, it doesn't take long. I'm getting tired of this phone. Do you do it in Photoshop, the fire with torches? Are you doing it with a uh, pencil?
Okay, something caught up with me. Good. Okay, good, good. It's on paper. I would just make the, the, the fire from the torches a simple shape. A simple shape. Maybe a couple of simple shapes. The simpler, the better. Because when you color it in Photoshop, that way uh, it, it all stands out as a very recognizable shape that can be uh, used to um, then you can create silhouette around it. And then the shape doesn't interfere with the uh, lighting effects. start to cook with gas here. Oh, here we got it. Okay. Let's start putting this here. And um, I maybe better put that as a gray. Better make that, start making that a gray. Otherwise, it's going to look like sides of beef. Maybe I just better kind of gray that up. I don't want this to look like he's uh, thrown out cow puppets. Yeah. Well, even though you might think that trees look kind of brownish, they're gray. Almost all trees are gray. Bark is universally gray. Unless it's a an ash tree. which they have a lot of in Massachusetts, an awful lot of them. Yeah, you, you drive yourself nuts if you uh, try to um, make every uh, one of your torches into some kind of a uh, unique thing. Simplify it, simplify, simplify. That's what Alex Toth used to say. Simplify, simplify, simplify. The more you do that, uh, the easier it becomes to actually get your, uh, your idea across. And then your composition becomes king. You want really your composition to uh, be simple enough because you're going to have implied directional lines that are going to lead the viewer's eye through everything. And you want the, uh, you can only do that with uh, extreme simplicity. You do it too complex and it just gets, it's too much. Um, really good person to look at is uh, Joan Zerat, a guy named Mobius. I did Lieutenant Blueberry, who was after Toth and and uh, Kurt Swan and Kirby and stuff like that back in the early seventies. Somehow, I think it's through the uh, Comic Book Buyer's Guide. Alan Light's publication. I uh, saw this advertisement for Lieutenant Blueberry. 
It was all in French, and I didn't read French because I didn't pay much attention to languages in school. But uh, I bought it. Now it's in, now you get it in English. But I just read it and read it and read. It. I just I figured I knew what the heck was going on. Simply because he's such a good storyteller. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of. He does that kind of thing where he, he just really you know what's going on in his work. There's not much fool around. Now I'm going to play around dodging with my toe. There we go. But it's toe, yeah. Get rid of the tone where he is because I want him to stand out. Now, let me get a little bit of the light. Okay. Huh. Can I do it this way? Brush and increase the size of the brush. Cool. Well, don't let the Chinese off the hook. Uh, the torches represent each country, represent all the corrupt corporations. Don't let the Chinese off the hook. They were uh, stockpiling med medical supplies when they're covering it up. So, uh, There are a lot of dead people uh, that have their blood on Chinese hands. But the Chinese people, Chinese people are cool, wonderful people. I used to live with Chinese people in graduate school. But uh, government of China? Ugh.
I'm telling you. One of the things you want to uh, note and take care of when you're doing color, C-M-Y-K. When you're doing color, unless you are using it for a shadow area or to, sub, uh, to create a subordinate area, you want to make sure there's no K in your color. It'll knock down your color. And there's no need to do that. You can uh, use other means to uh, get uh, get uh, to knock down color. You want to. Uh, this is be especially uh, uh, important when you're working uh, producing your print version, because you're going to be using CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and uh, and K, which is black. You don't want to be black if you can avoid it. Especially for like areas like this that, where the sky is. You can knock it down with that tone area. And it's actually better to use a tone like a, this beige than just a regular gray because then you're adding black to your color. If you tone it down with a beige, you're going to get a chromatic neutral. Chromatic neutral is a gray. It's a gray made of color. Grays made of color are more interesting than regular grays. Though gray, regular grays, black and whites, variations thereof, have their place. It's just that uh, chromatic grays zing. And that's something that the uh, Freshness taught us. Actually, all the uh, all the uh, that uh, landscape of the fall of Icarus, full of chromatic grays. He wasn't using black and white. He was using complementary colors mixed together, which are what chromatic grays are, and using those as his values instead of uh, just uh, black and white and all that other stuff. Though it is. Uh, common in Renaissance paintings to have uh, the uh, yeah, the underpainting as just gray grays, blacks and whites, because in the underpainting, you want to work all your drawing problems out. And in doing that, you, uh, uh, you don't need color. And then you um, add um, the color in the uh, overpainting, in the glazing area. And uh, works beautifully. That's how Leonardo did it. You see that in the, his uh, unfinished adoration of the Magi. You can also see it in... Um, Rembrandt's unfinished uh, Christ Before Pilate, which is all, an, it's just an unfinished painting. And uh, you can see that he uh, worked out all his drawing problems, uh, not even thinking about color. Now, Rembrandt didn't use a lot of color in his work, especially his later work. But he was using, what he was using, he was using all these browns and these, uh, uh, values and everything as his uh, his tonal area. And he just basically let it take over the painting. And then where he wanted it to uh, sing, that's where he put a little bit of color. Or he'd make it uh, really uh, bright there using that, like theatrical lighting. You see I'm getting all this overlay. Don't worry about that. I'll uh, soften all those smudges with a smudging tool. I'm not worried about whether or not it looks uh, goofy because I'm going to manipulate that later. That may be what I do tomorrow because it's uh, 12.30 and about 1 o'clock I'm going to stop. Then I'll start it up tomorrow morning. If you don't tell some of your uh, friends we're working on graphic novels to come and take a look and, uh, hey, anything I can do to help. 
I'm a teacher. I think the most important thing an artist does is to teach. One thing, young artists are a lot of fun. And uh, if they listen, it's fun to teach them. And I have had some of the most amazing students come through my classes. One of them right now is in Florence, Italy. The guy has the kind of uh, skills that you would, uh, uh, he's like, you know, a little Leonardo da Vinci. It's Italian too, Italian, Venezuelan. And uh, so we went over to Italy and he fits in real well because uh, he speaks fluent Italian, which he learned from his, uh, yes, his father, his father. Oh, is his father or his mother? Anyway, they, uh, they teach language. So they probably pick that up. It's also a genius. So it's, there's nothing like uh, having a great student. And I, the most amazing thing about teaching is that when you teach, you learn. I've learned more about art being a teacher than I ever did in undergraduate graduate school. Because when you teach, you better know so what you're talking about. So you have to do a lot of research especially in teaching art history, I've had to uh, know what the heck I was talking about. You know, it's a tough field. And so let me see, let me try to get this in here. It's not necessarily has to be in the... I'm gonna lay these in. See if I can get them. Can't you see what I can do here? Oh, I have, oh, I have one of this over here. Okay. I'm going to go over to the tone area. Now I'm going to create my focal area, which will be these two guys. I uh, get rid of the tone. See how you. Uh, you just like automatically create your focal area by just lightening up these guys, leaving the rest of the guys in shadow. You put these guys into focus.
And what I have, this is the thing that where I'm coming from, is that as I develop this, I want these colors to like blare out, sing at you, really, really um, work its color. I want it to be as full of saturation as I possibly can, which I will deal with as I go along. Because if you work with the color, the way color can be used, you can you don't have to worry about uh, saturation and, and, uh, and all this stuff. You, you just work at full saturation. If you use the color, using chromatic neutrals, um, everything will work out. Let me see. I'll go up here. Yep. In the color section, I'm going to uh, get rid of all these, uh, these areas that uh, are overlapping. When I was a kid, most of my friends are musicians too. Uh, I uh, I knew a lot of musicians, uh, at least at one time. Back when I was around, you know, 21, 22, or anything like that, I knew uh, some uh, rhythm and blues uh, bands that uh, I used to hang out with. Uh, really nice guys. So uh, there were there were times when I didn't know any artists. Uh, when I like was out out of school and uh, working my way through college, you know, I didn't have time to hang out with artists most of the time. In college, you get to know a lot of people. I don't know how old you are, but uh, go to college and then hang out with um, with uh, people in your art department. Most of, most of the great artists right now are in illustration. Though it's a real tough field. I'm getting that revolving. That little rotary phone. There you go. Okay. I'm working on an old laptop. Someday I'm going to get myself a, a newer iMac. I don't want to buy an uh, absolute new one. I already spent an incredible amount of money on uh, a desktop years ago. I don't think I'm going to do that again. Before I stop, give me the road refund. There we go. Let's go back there. Okay. Get down here. On that edge. I don't know if I did that. Ah, strength 41. That's why I'm getting it. Yeah. I'll make it 100. There. There. Now I don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to mess with very much, Jimmy. <laughs> okay. That's why it was taking forever to do this. Okay. Maybe that was a little bit too uh, strong. I don't know. Oh, normal.
So let's uh, let's uh, get rid of that right there. A student who uh, I recommended him to get into Pratt in the architecture program. Like Robert Redford, he uh, dropped out after a year, went to Hollywood. Well, he had to go to Hollywood, he went to Los Angeles and uh, became a rock and roll singer. Now he's got a, a music contract. He just cut his first album. He toured in Europe last summer for all this junk hit. With, uh, and he was playing in stadiums with, uh, with an old 80s band uh, called Toto. And uh, he's having a, a heck of a time. Look him up, his name is Jules Galli. He's French, he's from uh, Leon, France. Well, I, I've got friends in Leon, France. And uh, boy, guy has got a, a, a set of pipes. Guy has got a set of pipes on him. And he should do, do well because he's movie star handsome. It helps when you're movie star handsome. You know, nothing like uh, uh, making it easy for people to look at you. I always help. You never, you notice there, except for Mick Jagger, maybe, not too many uh, really ugly people in rock and roll. Go up to your tone. Get rid of that one little thing right here. Uh, uh, get rid of this one little thing, which is bothering me. Wait for that to be there. Wait for that to be there. Well, I think that middle panel is starting to turn into something. Now it's just a matter of laying in shadows. The rotary phone is giving me trouble again. Okay. okay, that that's a little bit. <laughs> We own a corgi. He's a yappy little dog. He's uh, he's not aggressive. What he is, he's saying, "Come play with me. Come play with me. Get over here. Play with me." He wants all dogs to come play with him. He's got friends at the, his doggy daycare that he goes to. Um, he goes to doggy daycare. At least once a week and uh, he gets to swim all day and then 
roll around the, in the grass with his friends. So when he sees a dog out, he doesn't know the difference between uh, being a doggy daycare and uh, being here. So he thinks you should be playing with him all times. He's only three years old. Still, uh, dogs have a tendency to live out their puppy fantasies at least the first four years. Now I'm going to start. See, the great thing about this, using mul a multiply layer with this watercolor brush, is the more you press using the pressure on my little lock of tablet. Higher saturation you get. Now, where did I put the color? Yeah, the color's there. Okay. Um, behave. Okay. Then, see what happens here. Nothing. Okay, I'll do that. What if I do this? Okay, yeah. Go back to color. So yeah. add to this. Fix that little problem there. And 
Cleaning up the edges a tiny bit. So you don't have to get crazy about it. Not just yet. Okay. It happened. I'll use to my advantage in a minute. Yeah, I'm gonna play around with my current tool. I'm going to do about creating some contrast between them. Uh, better talk a little louder. Uh, I'm gonna see what I can do about creating a little more contrast in certain areas so things start to stand out. One of the things you do when you, uh, when you design any drawing is you are cognizant that the viewer in Western civilization reads from right to left because that's the way we read uh, text. We also read habitually from left to right. If you're reading in Arabic or Hebrew, read from right to left. And if you're in the Orient, using Chinese or Japanese, you're reading from top to bottom. Notice some of their landscapes. You notice that they have a tendency to um, organize things from the top to the bottom. because that's the way it's read. Let me color Blue Boy's hat. Well, let me break that. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to and uh, neutralize that good. 
that I'll get out of it. You boys have color. Okay. Okay. The uh, color is what's happening. Maybe the end of it for today because it's about one o'clock in the afternoon and I'm hungry as a bear. A lot of cleaning up to do, but that's part of the fun of it. Had again, but it's flesh color. Then. But start to get there. And tomorrow I'll fix. I'll finish it. Okay. So, um, grit and guts. Uh, it's really. Ha I'm really happy you came and uh, took a look at what I was doing. I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, if you get any friends who'd like to come take a look at it, I'd happy be happy to show my uh, stuff uh, then too. And um, before you go, make sure you. Uh, We'll take a look at, uh, I bought this last night, the Guardian. Guardian number one by Tom Carter came out. I bought it, it's only a couple of bucks and uh, it looks like a pretty good issue. So, uh, Find him uh, on Comixology, and uh, always nice to support independent uh, publishers because that's us too. So hey, it's coming together. It's coming together. I'll mess around with this color here and make it a little more. Uh, you make it sing a little more, and down here I'll work on this, and this won't be too uh, difficult to fix. Okay, so. Uh, um, Yes, certainly. I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing you, uh, grit and guts, and uh, uh, like it. Uh, like my uh, subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Uh, go over to uh, Blue Boy Brown by David Greg Taylor on Facebook and like that, and then uh, follow it. And then you can uh, find David Greg Taylor on Facebook also. And I will be back at ten o'clock tomorrow. Uh, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let's hope it uh, lives up to uh, your uh, compliment. I've got a, a lot of work to do. Let me let me just 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 for the fun of it, I'll show you. Um, I'll show you that. Uh, I'll show you that uh, one I was talking about. Uh, foreground, middle ground, and background. I'll show you that one. Okay. Okay, uh, pictures five hundred. The blue book around thirteen hundred. Ah, what I have eight and nine. Uh, let me see. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. That's what get. That thing right there. Yeah. This right here. So I mess around with uh, foreground, middle ground, background there. I may recolor this in preparation for the um, print version. Because I think I could. I'm a lot farther along in uh, my journey back to comics now. I think I can make it better. But uh, it's right up the old zombie. <laughs> right, this guy could be a zombie later on. So uh, that's a page eight and nine. Uh, and you go to, let me put my banner up. For the website, the website is right there, blueboybrown.com. Please help me out getting people to um, <clears throat> come and visit my comic and come visit my uh, YouTube stuff. Tell all your buddies, and I'll visit your stuff too, and we'll just uh, be a mutual admiration society, which is what all this stuff should be, especially in indie comics. Uh, we don't want the big guys, the corporations, telling us what to do, so we got to do it ourselves. And we got to help each other out. So um, when you come out, when you uh, have your stuff, I want to see it. Send me uh, any uh, thing you're doing and uh, anything I can do to help you out. See, I can I can pr I can improve that right there. See, right there, I can make that a lot better. I can make all this a whole lot better. I kind of like this in some ways, but I can make all this a whole lot better. Anyway, I will be back tomorrow. Okay. Let me read your last comments. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, and I will be back tomorrow. So let me put my... Um, uh, Artboard, my, my opening screens. Yeah, that's where we are. Blue Boy Brown, The Adventures of a family okay so i will see everybody tomorrow and this is the old man signing off that's uh